very honored to be here. I know mostly secondhand, but now this evening a little bit more firsthand of the high standards of the university, and I understand you're about to begin an MA program, which is a very important supply source for museums, and uh, I know that will be uh, intellectually and culturally an important investment. We come to Hong Kong with regularity. In fact, I have a wonderful trustee who lives here, Cindy Chuate, and I look with admiration on the work of Hong Kong Art Gallery, of Asian Art Archives, Parasite, and now this amazing new institution that we'll share together called M Plus. So for those reasons and for many others, we are somewhat envious of your immediate future. Turn it on, yeah. Yeah, better. So some people may know the Guggenheim Museum. Here it is proving that it has waterfront property. It's, uh, as you may know, it's on 89th Street, so it's uptown in New York on the east side, and it's fronting onto Fifth Avenue, and then in front of it is Central Park, and we're looking at the reservoir where the water that we drank used to come from. Now it's a playground for seagulls. But the museum's in a particular place because this, <laughs> sorry. Oh, I can use this one, right, okay, yeah. This gentleman, Solomon R. Guggenheim, who was born in 1861, it's important to remember these dates, I think, died in 1949, became a collector relatively late in his life, around age 65, and he was directed by a woman who later became the head of his foundation. His idea was eventually, in the late 1930s, to present the pictures that he owned, and they were exclusively paintings, in a public space, and he chose ultimately to ask Franklin Wright to do that. So this is Solomon R. Guggenheim. He was one of seven sons of Meyer Guggenheim, who was a very uh, lively entrepreneur who, with his family, immigrated from Switzerland to Philadelphia and then later to New York, and this original source of their very great wealth was an enormous stake in the silver mines of Western United States beginning in the 1860s and later, as you may know, they controlled most of the copper in the universe, our universe, and one of their great sources of wealth was they mined ore and they also smelted ore. So in a way they had an early monopoly on metals in North America and finally around the world. He was the most conciliatory of the seven brothers and really directed the operation of the company called M. Guggenheim and Sons, particularly in Mexico and then later in Alaska, which became great sources for copper, as you may know. In the late 1920s, his wife uh, asked this woman, and we're seeing her later in the 1920s, to make a portrait of her husband. This is a woman called Hilla Rebe, uh, she's from Germany, had studied with some of the Bauhaus professors, knew particularly Jean Arp, uh, and was a frequenter of the avant-garde in Munich before coming to America in the early 1920s. She was herself a practicing artist. In the course of her making a portrait of Mr. Guggenheim, they became quite friendly, and she suggested to him that most of what he'd purchased in the previous 25 years was worthless, and that he should give up on these second-rate Barbizon painters and instead begin investing in what she called, in a weird translation of Germany, non-objective painters. And these are principally abstract artists, beginning essentially with Vasily Kandinsky. And that's really the core of the museum's collection. So 1930s, they began to have a number of paintings, and he lived in Long Island, Mr. Guggenheim, with his wife in a very fancy French chateau on the water, but they kept an apartment at the Plaza Hotel, 
uh, in Midtown New York, and he would invite the public in to this apartment on Thursday afternoons to take a look at what he had. You can see that some of these paintings look peculiar, and they're mostly by an artist named Rudolf Bauer, who was very close to Hilla Rebay, who doesn't really have very much going on in today's world, but they also had important pictures by Leger, Kandinsky, in some of the bedrooms. So as an uninitiated viewer, you would go into this very wealthy person's apartment and look at what were really quite unusual paintings for America, even in the 1920s. Another thing I want to say, which is maybe also applicable here, at a certain moment in the 1920s, powerful women really organized three important museums. Uh, Mrs. Rockefeller, beginning the Museum of Modern Art with two of her friends, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney and Juliana Force, her good friend, organizing the Whitney Museum, where I used to work, and then Hilla Rebay putting together what she called the Museum of Non-Objective Painting. So here's where the museum moved uh, in 1939. This was a remodeled car showroom on East 54th Street in Manhattan. You can see it's a museum because there's a neon sign on the right that says museum. <laughs> Peculiar space, but no longer existing, but important in certain ways. So this is an indication of how odd the presentation was and how also unusual the pictures might have been with these very overscaled frames and being shown on velour walls with fluorescent lights overhead, very low benches, and they were piping in music principally by Bach to make a sort of Gesamtkunst work. You were encouraged to lie down on the benches if you liked. And I only had no one friend who went to this site in the 10 years that it was in existence. He himself was rather eccentric, and he told me it was the damnedest place he'd ever been. <laughs> Another view of that same space. This time you see better pictures by Kandinsky. You can also see that she puts the paintings very low to the floor, which is quite unusual. But these are all predicated on spiritualist ideas that were, to some degree, misinterpreted by Hilla Rebay, but useful in her idea about what the purpose of art would be. And for her, abstraction was really a way for people to live better, to think differently, and to some degree, even have better health. So in 1943, with the support of Mr. Guggenheim, and here she is in her full regalia, she wrote to Frank Lloyd Wright, the uh, very great American architect, and invited him to build a temple of the spirit. That's how she described the museum, which is quite a charge, I think. And in, this is an early iteration of the building, not as it was built, but you can see her great pride in what might be coming. That's 1943. This picture is 1952, I think. It took an altogether 16 years to make the building happen. So if you're slightly unhappy about how long it's taken for M plus to happen, <laughs> remember the museums have very slow births, typically. And here she is, uh, very happy with these two not so happy gentlemen. <laughs> so. That's Solomon R. Guggenheim in the middle. He knows he's paying the bill. <laughs> and that's frankly right on the right. And he's even older than Mr. Guggenheim because he was born before the American Civil War. So this would really be the last great uh, building that he would oversee. And in fact, it was finished and opened before either of them, I mean, before either of them could see it because they both died. This is the site at an early moment. Uh, Wright was hopeful that the museum would be built in a park on the west side of the city uh, with the idea that people should drive there because he was obsessed with automobiles. And he kept insisting to the family that it should be on a hill, which was also his preferred site for all buildings, and that one should drive there. Finally, the family said no in a very definitive way, and they began amassing this property between 88 and 89th Street. So I think, yeah, we're seeing, this is 89th Street today, and then you'll see that there's an apartment building on the 88th Street side, which temporarily, here's 
writes one of his last drawings for this project. There's the apartment building that served for almost six years as the museum. It was cleaned out and a whole new set of programs happened because Mrs. Rebay was encouraged to go away. She didn't get along with Frank by right in the end. And the museum hired a very qualified curator from the Museum of Modern Art called James Johnson Sweeney. And he oversaw really the construction and the realization of the museum. Of course, Wright had very difficult ideas, including no electric lights in the museum. So the director had to say, hell no. He wanted it to be painted a very bright color of pink. And the family said, hell no. <laughs> And finally, as you know, and we live with this today, the walls are at a very steep angle to the floors. So in fact, it's a very uh, pronounced mold for everything that we choose to do. These buildings, as I said, were ultimately pulled down. Here's what they look like on the inside with this early Brancusi exhibition, Mrs. Rebay said that sculpture was not art, so the museum owned no sculpture in its first 15 years, but very quickly, James Johnson Sweeney, who was a devotee of Calder and a very good friend of Brancusi and other sculptors, added work by them to the collection. So the construction actually finally began in 1956. The entire block now is owned by the Guggenheim Foundation and let me elucidate my title. I'm the director of the museum, which is really the most interesting part of what I do. But I'm also the director of the foundation, and the foundation is the legal representative for all of the museums that I'll be talking about. So I have a kind of two-part job, one of them extremely interesting, and the other one periodically interesting. <laughs> You can see this very organic form now. You see the circle that will eventually become the interior of the museum. And then to the north, this form that looks like a leaf, he would call the monitor. And we'll see how that realizes itself later on. Technique is to use gunite, which we typically think of as a material for swimming pools. So the gunite was pushed into these wooden forms to make this very unusual building, which many people thought wouldn't last, uh, wouldn't particularly work, was inappropriate for the site, et cetera, et cetera. It, there it is in its glory in the autumn of 1959. So we're celebrating a 60 year anniversary this October for the opening of the building. And that's what it looked like on the opening night. Right one in a certain respect because you could drive your car through the museum Today, we're, we have a gift shop in that area. <laughs> but there was a port cochere that you could drive your car through to 89th Street if you liked. Those were the happy days when Fifth Avenue was a two-way street. And here's the opening day in 1959 for the museum. Many architectural critics objected to the building. As you probably know, New York, unlike Hong Kong, is a completely gridded city. And it's composed essentially of rectangular and square buildings. So to have a round building inside the grid was really quite unlike what people were accustomed to. And beyond which, um, it was hard to imagine how the interior of the building would lend itself to looking at art in the long term. This is the first exhibition. One of the charms of the building was that right was keen on incorporating nature into the interior. So you'll see lots of photos of trees and hanging vines. And in fact, it's a kind of remnant of a Victorian aesthetic. And I have a monthly struggle with the curators to make certain that there's greenery inside the building, as I think it's so important, particularly today, when we live on a somewhat threatened planet, to keep reincorporating the notion of nature, which was Wright's intention from the beginning inside the building. As I said, Solomon Guggenheim died uh, in 1949. And this is his nephew, Harry Frank Guggenheim, who took over the operation and construction of the institution. He was a well-known uh, aviation investor, ultimately owned a newspaper in Long Island with his wife, really didn't give a fig about art. But he was very keen on the building being finished correctly.
and I'm showing it to you to remind you that until this very late date, until the 1960s, every trustee of the Guggenheim was a member of the family. It was very much a family institution. Let's say that from 1959 till about 1970, in my opinion, or even later, the curators understood the building only partially. And also there was a giant change in art beginning in the 19, late 1960s, not only in scale, but also in what artists would have thought as, a, as appropriate material. So I'm showing you a few views of very experimental shows that happened over the last 25 years. This is the igloo of Mario Meritz, and you can also see uh, a motorcycle coming down the outside of the ramps. Uh, in 1979, and this is the first big exhibition that made an impression on me, as a young, I'm not sure I would call myself an art historian, but a curious person. This is the Joseph Boyce exhibition, which happened in 1979. You can see they're towing a, a VW van up the ramps in order to make this piece on the left, which really was the introduction for Joseph Boyce to the United States and to the audience of the museum. Um, Ellsworth Kelly, show in 1996. We have to admit that the ceiling height is such that horizontal painters really profit more than vertical painters, and things have to be very carefully cho chosen. We had a Christopher Wool show a few years ago, and I know that some of you would have seen his pop-up exhibition here last year, and you may have noticed his preferred format is sometimes eight and nine feet high, and we really couldn't accommodate that. So. The museum had to make some very judicious choices about how to represent his achievement in a way that would allow itself to be hung in this beautiful but complicated place. Uh, then more recently, the Italian artist Maurizio Catalan, we chose with him, actually he chose, and we tried to execute an exhibition of everything that he'd ever made hung from the dome of the museum. So this is everything the artist made, all suspended on wooden platforms with the title All, which was quite graphic and a very popular exhibition. I'm showing these, these to you to prove to you and also to myself that the museum's adapted, its curatorial staff in particular and designers as well, in using the space so that it's very different from most other museums, but frequently quite, I think, impressionable and important. And then you know also this great Chinese artist, Saiko Chang, who made an exhibition in 2008 that was intensely popular and very well received by our audiences. In fact, I think it's one of the probably 10 most popular exhibitions in the history of the museum. And you can see that he took full liberty with this void, which is essentially the character of the museum on the interior. Subsequent to that, we invited James Terrell to make an exhibition, and he chose to basically obliterate the space in favor of this uh, oval light presentation that he's well known for with LED lights changing on a kind of regular basis. This was also one of the most well-received exhibitions we've had, and I think it's indicative, and I know Others of you recognize this, but in today's world, it's not always possible to put a picture on the wall and say to someone, here's what you should be doing. We have to sort of eliminate that word should in favor of here's what you could be doing. In other words, to make the exhibition much more of an experience. And this turned out to be hugely popular with thousands and thousands of people lying on the floor in the rotunda every day. And then most recently, the Art in China show organized by our curator, Alexander Monroe, which looked at developments, uh, more recent developments. Here's an incredible Chen Zen, the bicycle piece, and uh, works in a sort of subsidiary gallery also by Chen Zen in the background. You see Song Dong and then a great piece by Xu Bing in a room by itself. Sets of exhibitions that really, I think, are a very good introduction for our visitors to what's happening with younger Chinese artists. There are commissions. This is the great female artist, Xiao Fei, and this also was a tremendously popular part of our program last year. Um, 
we imagine now with the expertise that we've gained not only from making these exhibitions but also from the research that we do around them, I think I can say with some accuracy that the Guggenheim has as thorough a knowledge of China, contemporary China art as any museum in North America and we're very keen on making certain that that knowledge is demonstrated on a regular basis. We attract about one million visitors a year. Two-thirds of them are tourists, therefore they're from a variety of countries. Most of what we do is available in five or six languages and we think we're in that way a kind of ongoing encyclopedia for inquisitive audiences. Then in 1979 uh, Salman Guggenheim's niece, Peggy Guggenheim, who had been a gallerist both in Paris and in London and driven out back to New York by Nazism, gave her villa, which she'd moved to in 1949. There are lots of nines in this. I hope that's an auspicious number. It, to the Salman R. Guggenheim Foundation as a kind of subsidiary or ancillary place, that early slide that we saw was the villa that she owned, which is on the Grand Canal in Venice, and today is called the Peggy Guggenheim Collection. You probably know she was a flamboyant collector, uh, very active in many ways, socially and amorously, and she and her, really with very little guidance, although she was a close friend of Marcel Duchamp in particular, she amassed, which is, I think, unquestionably one of the great collections of the period 1920 to the 1960s. And she lived in Venice in the last 30 years of her life in this villa, and she went on collecting Italian artists in particular, along with uh, some oceanic and African material. And I'm throwing this in because she'd also, while living in New York, been the principal patron of Jackson Pollock. She gave him a monthly stipend, took all the paintings that he made, which she very generously distributed to museums all over the world subsequently. So there it is, that's her villa. It was meant to be a five-story high palazzo, but the family ran out of money <laughs> in the 18th century. So we think of it sometimes as the only ranch house in Venice, but it offers us on the terrace of a great way of entertaining people and we've been able to also secure properties behind. You see a garden, which is very important. We own some properties behind, and we have a very big exhibition program, a program for children, educational program, and altogether it attracts about 450,000 people a year. We're the second most visited museum in Venice, which is a city of great museums, and it's proven to be I think a wonderful way for the New York Guggenheim to recognize the beginnings of a broader universe. So until 1949, it was very much a New York-centric museum preoccupied essentially with German art. After that, particularly with the advent of owning Peggy's collection, the museum has become much more of a global institution deliberately a few scenes from inside the house. We've made a very big effort to maintain her furniture and a strong sense of the way that she used the pictures. Then 10 years later in 1989, the Basque government came to my predecessor and asked, could the Guggenheim imagine renovating a wine warehouse in the city of Bilbao as a contemporary art center? and uh, this was Tom Krenz, and he very cleverly realized there could be more ambition in the Basque people's uh, thought about culture. Ultimately, we, the museum was given this riverside site in a city that suffered from having been highly industrialized, living on a polluted river site, and not one with a profile for visitors from the West. After engaging Frank Gehry to design the building, it became probably the most important building, in my opinion, in the second half of the 20th century. And today, it's a symbol of this medium-sized city of about one million people, recognizing how integral culture can be to a better sense of um, pride. <laughs>
So I think the Basque, who at that moment were still fighting amongst themselves, and you'll remember that there were the horrible terrorists who were keen on making the Basque country autonomous within Spain, essentially gone today. <clears throat> and this great building and the program and the city at, at large, <clears throat> excuse me, now attracts about 1.2 million people to a city of 1 million. It's quite powerful, and you'll hear people talk sociologically and artistically about the Bilbao effect. You'll have a version of that here, although your city already has millions and millions of very informed visitors. I think a new set of people will come with the opening of M+. And the signal to the museum is this great piece by Jeff Koons called Puppy, which is changed four times a year and made of flowers. Excuse me. The interior, when I, I went to the opening because I lived in Pittsburgh and we were angry that that industrial city was ahead of our industrial city. <laughs> and I went even before the opening and I came back and told the mayor, I think, I'm very skeptical it's going to get built because it looks like such a complicated plan. And I know when it does get built, no one will go there. It's just too complicated. And I was so wrong. We built the Andy Warhol Museum, but not with enough ambition. And we're having, in Pittsburgh, about 180,000 people a year, as opposed to their 1.2 million. In any case, I'm showing you some of the interiors, which at the moment, when the museum opened 21 years ago, struck me as not human. The spaces were so uh, large and complicated that I found them to my mind, somewhat hostile to art. What's interesting now is, as the landlord, the co-landlord with the Basque, I find the museum very receptive to art and that we've changed our own sense of what appropriate spaces might be for art. Here's a great piece by Klaus Oldenburg, and you probably know that Richard Serra took over this uh, extremely long space and populated it with this very important piece made of steel, which, by the way, was Bill Bao's big product in the old days. They don't produce steel there any longer. But this wonderful labyrinth called A Matter of Time. Then finally, um, we have for 11 years been in deep conversation with the United Arab Emirates to build a museum in Abu Dhabi which when we began 11 years ago, I found to be an unknown and somewhat remote space. Place in the intervening 11 years, I think UAE in particular has become something that we think about more frequently. And with the proximity of Dubai to Abu Dhabi, it's now the world capital for airplane transits. It's larger than Heathrow, bigger than the airport in Atlanta and really a crossroads again in a very demonstrable way for the universe. So I'm showing you where UAE is, as I didn't know 12 years ago particularly where it was. There's Abu Dhabi. They don't show Dubai because these two cities aren't so friendly sometimes. But as you can see, it's directly on what we call, used to call the Persian Gulf, but now has a different name sometimes. But it's a city where there really wasn't much. The country dates to 1971. Uh, in the bottom part of the slide, you can see with the word Abu Dhabi, the old section of the city. So this was built principally after 1971. The idea was to take a 21-mile long island, basically a large sandbar called Sadiat Island, and make that into a cultural sphere. So the red lines up at the top there show you where a new construction would happen and has happened. And now that was the early vision of what would have happened to the island with uh, the Guggenheim on the promontory at the left, the Louvre, Abu Dhabi un underneath this dome, a building by Zaha Hadid, which would have been an opera house, another building by Tadio Ando, which would have been a maritime museum, none of which was built ultimately, but many other things have been built. In fact, today there are about 13 luxury hotels up and down this beach, and it's inhabited by about 10,000 people, and NYU has its very large campus there as well. So I wanted to show you how the Louvre turned out 
and I was there last week and can recommend that it's a very good one day visit in particular. It's directly on the water. This is a, a designed by the French architect Jean Nouvel. Part of the ambition of this, again, like M Plus, was to have a world class facility designed by architects that are known around the world. And this is a building that's being constructed now, designed by Norman Foster, which will be the National Museum for History, the Sheikh Zayed Museum, and that should open in about a year and a half, I think. Then from above, you can see an early iteration of the Jean Nouvel building, the white saucer, and the Frank Geary building out on that promontory. That is meant to be Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. This is a model from 12 years ago, so there have been a few changes. But the idea was to help one another understand in these colored boxes which activities would be happening where, because this is a 350,000 square foot building, almost as big as M plus, but it's also 21 stories high. So it's quite a monument on the water. There are four levels for art only, but their number of rooms that have 30 meter high ceilings. So it's quite monumental. The beginnings, I would say again, of a different kind of space that we'll have to adjust to and our children will think is natural. Early iterations, you see these very large blue cones which were meant to uh, recall heat transfer systems from ancient Arabia. And then finally, the way it will look, I think, uh, in future. So quite a large building. We've been uh, making a collection with the Emiratis over the last 11 years. We have about 400 objects now in the collection from around the world. I'm happy to say that one of our best and earliest purchases was a work by about 19 Chinese artists. We have around 100 objects from Chinese artists from the 80s, 90s, and early part of the years 2000, which we'll be showing with great pride. We've also taken it upon ourselves to look at the period 1965 until the present in great detail with the idea that it's a global institution, therefore needs to represent at its core Arab modernism, but beyond that, great artists from Latin America, which we've been working on over the last two years, African artists from Africa, of course, a number of artists from Europe and North America, but we hope in a new kind of narrative that really stresses creativity throughout the planet. And that's the way it will look when it opens in about five and a half years. So that's Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. So think of this constellation, the word that Derek <clears throat> used of New York, Venice, Bilbao, and soon Abu Dhabi in the Middle East. That's uh, the real estate of the Guggenheim. But the Guggenheim really has the, as its ambition to be one of the global players and to help people recognize in different cultures points of connection and also points of disparity in this struggle that we have daily of redefining what is beautiful. Thank you.